welcome to this episode of Out of Country. Out of Country is a leadership and philanthropy series where I get to sit down one-on-one -on -one with people who are doing inspiring, humanitarian, volunteer and philanthropic work in other countries. Today I have the pleasure of interviewing John and Beverly Bossett of Humanities Promise International. Thank you so much John and Beverly for inviting us to your home today. You're welcome. It's good to have you here. Thank you. So your charity, um, Humanities Promise International, has been around now how long? It's been around for since 19, uh, 2011 in terms of when we legally established it. It took us a couple of years to really get our feet on the ground and uh, we've been fully operational now within East Africa, South Sudan in particular for the past five years. Good, good. And I should just tell our viewers, if you haven't gone to their website yet, humanitiespromise.com, your charity focuses on humanitarian work in the country of South Sudan, which is in Eastern Africa, correct? Oh, yes. Mm -hmm. So your charity has been around since 2011. Mm -hmm. Okay. And uh, let's focus a bit more now. How, how did the charity uh, start. Uh, I'm always interested in the epiphanies, the the turning points of how it uh, how something comes about. Because um, you spend both of you spend most of your time now with that charity. Uh, mm -hmm. You're based here in Western Canada, just outside of uh, Calgary. But you you probably travel to uh, Eastern Africa for uh, two or three times a year, I imagine. Correct. Okay, yes. and I must. Uh, tell the reason why I wanted to grab this interview so quickly because both of you just returned from uh, a mission there about uh, three weeks ago I believe mm -hmm. yes and a very important point it Beverly this what that was your first visit there yes so I'd it like was. To, to talk more about that so what exactly what what kind of work do you do in uh, in South Sudan what do you focus on well originally um how this all started in South Sudan is that we had a very good friend that uh, turned into a, a good relationship and she came from the country of Magui, from that area. Okay. And um, when you go into, into a developing country, you need to focus on... Um, certain areas like a, a specific area because the whole nation needs help mm -hmm. and everywhere you look everywhere that you uh, drive you will see needs okay so how do you you can't help them all okay. so what you do is you focus on a certain mm -hmm. area and, and that was the area of um, obor. obor county uh very close to magui and um, we started with farmland, uh, introducing the idea of bringing seedlings, of planting fruit trees, and turning it into a self-sustaining uh, village area, farm area, where people would work, mm -hmm. they would take ownership of it because they were tilling the soil, and um, it, it would become a self-sustainable charity. Okay. And um, that's what we're very interested in because we have had the experience of feeding people. Okay. And we soon realized that that was not the answer. Mm -hmm. The answer is to do work that people participate in and they produce their own food. Sort of like teach the people how to fish and they'll have right. food for a lifetime. Because 80% of South Sudan's food is shipped in from Uganda. Really? The soil in South Sudan is marvelous for growing almost any kind of plant. Mm -hmm. I see. So to see the suffering, to see the lack of food is, uh, it's, it, you can't comprehend why that goes on um, because they have so much uh, beautiful soil that has never been 
used for raising food. Okay. I think and I saw on your website there's pictures of, uh, in fact, your charity uh, has uh, attained uh, or owns 250 acres that you are mm -hmm. still in a process of fully clearing to make it uh, uh, cultivatable, correct, for growing plants? The 250 acres has been granted to us for purposes of uh, developing new farming uh, styles. Oh yes. Mm -hmm. And uh, using the land uh, for purposes of developing new varieties of foods. Okay. That's actually been the thing that I've been working on, gathering uh, fruit, uh, fruit tree seeds uh, from fruits that are grown in Central and South America. Okay. I've been harvesting those seeds and uh, moving those seeds across the water into South Sudan and we have cleared a, a path of land and we do have a nice uh, propagation area going right now. Oh, okay, okay. So you're, uh, you're bringing in types of plants that uh, would, pro would grow quite well in their climate in uh, East Africa so that they can start growing their own, become self-sustaining, uh, uh, that they can feed themselves with rather than bringing, importing in uh, all that food, which right. I imagine costs a bit and they don't have, uh, I'm sure they don't have that kind of money. Well, mm -hmm. if you think about that something here that Beverly said, Beverly said that they're bringing in 80% of the food from Uganda. Mm. Well, that means uh, when food is being brought in, money is it is flowing out. Yes, that yes. creates a negative on their economy. Sure. So we're pretty strong onto the idea of of helping these people build an agricultural based economy. Mm -hmm. So we can zero in on the fruit growing uh, operation, which is um, something that we're doing. But really, our thoughts go far beyond the mm -hmm. fruit trees. They go they go into developing an industry, an agricultural based industry. Okay. And with an agricultural based industry, it's it's everything related to agriculture. So right at this moment in time, we're clearing land. We are propagating fruit, uh, bear, uh, fruit bearing uh, tree seeds. Okay. Uh, seedlings at the moment. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, they'll, it'll take us a couple years before they start producing any seed, any sure. fruit. Okay. But then two years down the road, we're now into the harvesting, we're into the um, uh, marketing. Right. So you see, it, it's, a, it's a broad industry. And then ultimately, there'll have to be supporting industries. There'll have to be a transportation system put in sure. place to market. Product. Initially, our, our yes. food that was grown will be used within South Sudan. Sure. But we're of the belief that we'll have to grow beyond that if we really hope sure. to develop an agricultural base. To First, they need to grow it so they can feed themselves. Yes. Mm -hmm. Then, once they start perfecting their growing, there's a surplus. Now they can start uh, selling it within their own economy. Exactly. And, yes. and starting the whole entrepreneurship. So, how long how long were you there in total this last trip? Uh, in in South Sudan, we were uh, there for two weeks. Okay. Yeah, uh, we left to go visit in Kenya. Okay. You know, so we we arrived home on the thirtieth of November, but South Sudan was very busy. We we hardly had a day off. Okay. Um. So yes, yeah, so it was. Uh, we we met with um, the farm group. Um, several times and then we met with um, another group of women that were represented from different areas of the Obor region okay. and um, we heard about their needs uh, and uh, so then we met with other people who heard about us and, and wanted to come and just visit with us at the guest house that we oh, were staying at. Great, yeah. great. Mm -hmm. So they tell you all their challenges and problems, which is good because while you're here, as we speak, things are still going on there. You do have people there yes. with your charity that live there that are committed to working on it. And yes. I imagine you communicate with them now, like through the internet with, daily. with, with Skype. We have daily, we have great. daily communications great. Uh, with the leaders uh, in South Sudan. 
Before we get too far away, I would like Beverly to, to tell our viewers about the meetings that we had with these ladies. Oh, sure. The, these ladies said <coughs> some pretty remarkable things to us, mm. and I would not want for us to miss talking about those ladies. Well, I think we met with about 15 ladies, and um, at first they were very shy. Uh, John and I were were with one of our our farm leaders, okay. and um, we actually met at the home that he grew up in as a child in the Obor community. Okay. So these women walked. I would imagine that some of them walked three or four miles to come to the meeting, and um, they told us about their each of them. They each spoke. Uh, they told us about their needs. Mm -hmm. um, they were widowed women whose husbands had been killed in the um, rivalry between Conflict. the uh, yeah. conflicts, the oh, tribal okay. conflicts, yeah. and um, the rebel army that had come in. And it was very dangerous for them. They could not walk on the road alone because they could be mm -hmm. uh, killed by a rebel force. Okay. Um, also, they talked about um, the orphan children that were left over from this oh, uh, okay. war. Many, there were many children. Uh, so a lot of these women took in, they had their own children, plus they took in children that were their relatives' children. One lady in particular had 19 to look after. Really? Okay. Um, another lady took in um, her her amount uh, came to about 12 children. Uh, some of the um, girls in their family were violated mm -hmm. and some of the girls have children out of that violation. That yes. Wow. Their biggest need and their biggest cry is that their children could go to school okay. and uh, so we said well what would be the cost of sending a child to school and they said twenty dollars for one school session mm. twenty dollars and a school uniform well wow. a school uniform costs about ten dollars okay and in our money that's not very much no it isn't um, much. it isn't but that's um, a real strong requirement that every child has a uniform. Is there any organization that's in there like I think uh, UNICEF works strictly with children in uh, developing countries? The answer to that no. is no. No. Okay. Yeah. Uh, they're, Not they're, in this particular uh, okay. area. So they're yeah. just left with the individuals that make their own little have their own little orphanages that when you mention 19 children that's an interesting in. interesting way of saying a mini orphanage yeah. these, uh, these uh, widows had undertaken to uh, gather up their relative you know the relatives that had been orphaned sure. yeah. and, yeah. They, and they bring them home and they do the best with it mm -hmm. you know the dominant cry that these women had were that they had these many children and it was tough to provide for these oh, many sure. children, but they could not afford to send them all to school. So here these uh, widows were having to make a choice. Yes. Which child will go to school this year? Mm -hmm. That was their deepest pain, tough. that their children could not be going to school. And they were destined to be caught in the same trap that they, these mothers and grandmothers mm -hmm. were being caught in. Okay. No mm -hmm. skill sets beyond agriculture, yes. very limited education, and it was painting them that these young people might be caught in the same trap as them. Mm. That was a something that left a deep uh, mark on me, and I wanted Beverly to talk about and, it. And that sort, of, that sort of detracts a bit from your main uh, charity's purpose there is... It adds uh, credence to our operation because we are of the belief that uh, most or all social ills mm -hmm. could be uh, improved a whole lot okay. if there was an abundance of or surplus added added income sure you know yeah. and so we're all about 
creating an, an economy. We feel that if we can inject some money into the local economy, mm -hmm. many of these things can be taken care of. Sure, yeah. The, 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 the road system could be improved. The educational systems could be improved. Uh, healthcare facilities could be improved. Sure. And then, of course, the thing that we've been talking about are these children. Mm -hmm. Can they get to school? Could all of them get to school if there is additional monies? The answer to that is yes. yes yeah. mm -hmm. Let's bring in the money okay. so that these children can get to school. And uh, that, that causes me to think uh, of, a, of an experience that happened last trip around when the, a local lady was crying about how the children, they were losing their children. Mm -hmm. uh, yes. to the city because there was no opportunities for them. The children mm -hmm. saw oh, no see. opportunity. Okay. Mm -hmm. So the, the children migrate to the cities and there they, they start finding their own, uh, their own little uh, opportunities of making whatever money they could. What I see, um, I, I am a former teacher, and mm -hmm. what I see is establishing a school close to the farm, not, of course, not right at the farm, but I see a village with mm -hmm. a school, um, with a church, uh, eventually with a medical facility, maybe attached to the school, and these people will can build their own bricks out mm -hmm. of the soil that they have. Okay. And then they burn the bricks, which yeah. gives uh, strength to the brick, and um, they they can build the walls they are capable okay. of doing that they have uh, molds for making bricks that's part of what they sell along the side of the road besides fruit vegetables they'll have a pile of bricks or yeah, um, yeah sure. uh, no, whatever no. they can create make on their own they will make and uh, i see a school being built out of the bricks mm -hmm. and I said if you build the walls we will put on the roof we will put in the windows and we will put on the door sure and there is one person that is a trained teacher in that area uh, but I have heard that all you have to do is advertise for a teacher and they will come. Really? There, are so there are a lot of trained teachers that are not employed. Oh, okay. Yes. So. Um, well, there's another little idea just to get that that uh, motion in, into uh, force. And uh, I don't know what the government in South Sudan is like. Is there any local support for things like that uh, for infrastructure? Not there's there's really no infrastructure. Nothing uh, to speak of. There's no support. Uh, for the educational system, the uh, the government is not making money available to uh, build a proper road system. Mm, okay. There are very few things that are done by the government. There are things that have been done by varying NGOs, and they've all been good and they've all been helpful. Okay. But I think that the many NGOs have not adequately addressed. Uh, the needs of the people at the food end of okay. things. As a former business person, I understand the necessity of uh, proper economies. You have to have a proper economy if you hope to have these other things. Now, you, your whole uh, charity, I should say, it is uh, Humanities Promise International is a registered Canadian charity with a, a tax number for donations, so any donations made to your charity are fully tax deductible here in in uh, Canada. You yes. also have a working board of directors, which we have, have we have quite a number of uh, board members, some within Canada, and some within South Sudan. Right. Mm -hmm. That's the important thing I want to emphasize is that you're actually getting them to be on your charity's board to have yes. an equal say at driving exactly because they would know best what is the best thing we could do now to get the biggest payback. I would like to say that uh, Humanities Promise is registered as an NGO within South Sudan. Okay, good. Mm -hmm. We have a fully functioning board of directors, Okay. Uh, bank account, we, we're just operational over there. We need it to be that way to be compliant 
with the laws of the land. Sure. And it would enable us to attract funding, uh, African funding. Sure, that's funding interesting. Funding coming directly from nice. NGOs that are positioned in Africa. So when do you when do you think you'll be making the next uh, the next trip? The the need actually would probably have us there in February or March. But wisdom would dictate to us that it's too hot for us to travel oh, at that time. <laughs> so I am thinking that we could push it a little into the latter part of March. Okay. Uh, it begins cooling down. The hot, dry season in South Sudan is January f and February and tailing off in, in, towards the end of March. Yeah. I'd also like to interject that um, many people would know that South Sudan is the youngest nation on earth. Oh, it is? It, was, uh, it gained its independence from the north in 2011. Okay. And um, so then it, that part of Sudan became South Sudan. And um, so the infrastructures are, they are quite weak. Mm -hmm. um, there are hospitals, there are NGOs that have done a lot of work establishing medical centers, um, but the, uh, still what is weak is the, is the agricultural development and the education development. Okay. Hope is the thing that's really needed. Yes. Hope. Hope is the big thing. Four letter yes. words. Yes. H O P E. Hope. Yeah, okay. It's uh it's a commodity in short supply over there. And atta it's attainable. Yes. Because like you said, you have local people involved with the charity, so they have buy in. A key strategic move, I believe, on our part. We uh we told them straight out, hey, we have uh, the heart's desire to mm -hmm. assist you. But quite truthfully, we're not coming unless you really see yourselves as the masters of your own destiny. Sure. You must see yourselves as the owner of this project. And when you can convince me that you take this seriously, that you see yourselves as managing this land and you see yourself as succeeding, then when I'm convinced, I will tell some of my other Canadian uh, farmer friends that, you know, I think the time is right. Let's go now and help them. And so that's what we did. We sure. had to wait. You will notice there's been a bit of a lag time. We had talked about working in South Sudan for five years. Yeah, we've been in five for five years, but there's three years of it in preparative, preparing the people. Sure. It, it took them that long to grab hold of what we've been talking about. They're now grabbed it and they're sure. doing well. We have 20 people working on the farm. Mm -hmm. Every Tuesday and every Friday, the 20 volunteers that have been there now since the latter part of April 2019. So here we are at the end of 2019, knowing that we have 20 people that have been there two days a week for seven Wow. Plus months. That's great. Marvelous group of people, and it's That's deeply great. encouraging for uh, Beverly and I and uh, the other members of our team to see the activities that are going on there every week. That's great. Mm -hmm. That's great. So there's good progress there. Mm -hmm. Big progress yeah. there. So mm -hmm. it yes, I think my vision is uh, to see a farm working well and a farm is not what we have in Western Canada with hundreds of acres. Mm -hmm. um, I see a farm of about 25 to 30 acres, uh, maybe even as much as 100 acres, sure. uh, developed, producing food, and uh, taking that food to market where they are able to sell it and have some finances of their own. Sure. And um, then I would also like to see a school, uh, again, I'm saying that, uh, established. And uh, where you see people, their lifestyle is has improved tremendously. Um, and I'd, I'd also like to see the young people, like the young teenagers, 
staying close to the land sure. and seeing themselves as being able to develop um, food and taking it into market no, sure, and sure. Uh, selling it and they can sell it in Megui and they can sell it to Juba. Now sure. there are businesses that will come along and uh, take their food and haul it away for them but that way they get very little very little money for all their yeah, sure. efforts. Yeah. So people do take advantage of you know people who have worked hard and uh, so if they have a way of taking it into Megui or Juba mm -hmm. they could be uh, get, have a decent income. And then and one it. day once they become a little more self-sustaining yes. uh, you can implant the fact that you are now entrepreneurs you're not only feeding yourself but yes. the little surplus that you have you can sell now or trade with other of your neighbors yes. and start setting up like micro economies. Right. Yes. yes. We, yes. we, we almost missed uh, the saying of one very important thing. Mm -hmm. uh, with this 250 acres that we have along the river, uh, our primary objective uh, from the very get-go was to create learning opportunities for the people. Mm -hmm. And you'll notice that I use the word learning opportunities. I purposely do not use the word teach or tell. We okay. try and create opportunities where the local people are able to see things. For most of them, it's the first time they've seen this thing mm -hmm. that we're talking about. So before we can hope to expand beyond the 250 acres and really reach out and do what we really want to do, yeah. uh, what we really do want to do is to help each person expand their own farming operations substantially. Sure. But they have to understand what it is that we are endeavoring to do. So. On this farm that we have established for Humanities Promise International, uh, we're using it as a vehicle to allow the other people to see new things, mm. buy into new things, envision themselves with a larger farming operation, sure. envision themselves prospering. So it's a like I say, it's a learning environment. Some people would say that's a teaching school. Yes, yeah, yeah, it might be yes. a teaching school, but we don't use those words. No, it's a good, a good idea, a good point not to do, not to use those words again. So uh, make it learning, make them feel like they're a part of, they're driving their own destiny. Yes. No one's yes. teaching them anything, we're assisting. So I'd love to talk more. This sounds like such an amazing charity that both you and your wife, Beverly, have uh, put together. Humanities Promise International. You can go to the show notes for this video and the link will be there that, that, that will take you to their website. The website has so many pictures, uh, most recent of your trip uh, just finished a few weeks ago and articles uh, explaining what uh, is happening there with the 250 acres. Thank you so much, uh, John and Beverly uh, Bossett, the founders and the principals of Humanities Promise International. Thank you so much, John. Thank you so much, Beverly. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.